try to cover in the next 15 minutes um, de-resuscitation, dry enough, when to stop CVH. Looks like a very easy question, but uh, I have to tell you that uh, I get some uh, migraine to prepare this talk because it's a rather very difficult question. But nevertheless, we will have a try. So, uh, some background and physiology. How to quantify over recitation? Mm -hmm. Clinical, perhaps, yeah, we have to see. Which method to use, single method versus multimodal? Mm -hmm. How to improve hemodynamical tolerance to fluid removal? Because most of the time we are using CRT in our patient, and although they have no more noradrenaline, they look, you know, very well fit, no more lactate, the echocardiogram said, well, plenty of fluid to, to remove, and you, tr you, you just start and try, you cannot, gosh. So, some research agenda and then some conclusion. Right, so, back to physiology, so we have the total body water, which is about 50 to 70 percent of the total body mass, and you have inside the total body water the intracellular fluid, which is about two-thirds, big one, and then the extracellular, sorry, the extracellular fluid, which is about one-third, so 25 percent of the body weight, and those three parameters are extremely important to monitor, if we can, during de-resuscitation. So, you have obviously some interaction between the intracellular space and the extracellular space, dividing the intravascular space and interstitial space. And when you have water crossing the intracellular space, we call this osmotic pressure, while it's crossing the intravascular space, we call it oncotic pressure. It's always important to bear in mind. So bioelectrical impedance might be indeed in the future a very good way to try to monitor when we de-resuscitate patients uh, by looking carefully to total body water, intracellular water, and extracellular water. Okay. Now, the whole idea of having someone a septic shock, it's obviously not only to say, well, there is some extravascular water, but there are also excess of water uh, in the intracellular water space, in the interstitial space, obviously, and then we have to remove this from the intracellular space back to the interstitial space and then back to the vascular space. And obviously, if we are too aggressive, we will empty the vascular space, and that be not too good because we have ischemia. And also, if we are empty too quickly the intracellular space, this may also not be that good. So we have really to focus a little bit more on this issue. So, O2 assess. Well, I assume you are all very good clinician, and you said, well, on based on clinical ground, we should try to, to um, uh, evaluate the patient. So the weight, as uh, Professor Gattinoni alluded to, very difficult, obviously. The cumulative fluid balance, uh, the v vital sign, urine output, physical e examination, the chest X-ray and historical information. In our uh, ICU, we use D3, these two here, cumulative fluid balance and physical examination and chest X-ray, obviously. Then we have some lab variables, okay? So blood lactate seems a quite good one to try to follow de-resuscitation because whenever the patient is too empty in the vascular space, it will rise and that's a something we can use. You could use also central or mixed venous oxygen saturation, some urinary biochemistry, like the fractional excretion of sodium and obviously bioelectrical impedance and vector analysis. 
we use this only for research purpose. Now, you need also, in my view, to assess amodynamical variables. And you can assess, let's say, static amodynamical variables, OK? But you have also to evaluate dynamic amodynamical variables, stroke volume variation, pulse pressure variation, um, then a change in vena cava diameter, passive leg raising uh, test inducing change in the um, uh, PICO parameters, and then also whenever you can using echocardiography and also whenever PICO. But you need to really have a constellation of clinical parameters, um, biological parameters, and hemodynamical parameters, not only static but also dynamic. That's very important. And we use these three in our ICU. OK. You have other variables uh, shown recently that uh, if you have an intra-abdominal pressure above 15, and between 15 and 20, you have a, already a lot of uh, uh, side effects in terms of renal output and in terms of uh, mesenteric ischemia. Uh, when the abdominal uh, pressure, uh, perfusion pressure is below 50 millimeter mercury, and then the ratio between extracellular and intracellular uh, water, uh, which is above 0.9, and the extravascular room water from the pico when it's above 12. Okay, so we face many times issue that we cannot remove extravascular fluid because we don't have enough fluid in the intravascular space. So there are some let's say, tricks to try to improve this. And we know that if we want to have a water pulling effect to get back the fluid from the interstitial space back to the uh, vascular space, we can use a non-cotic trick, albumin 20-25%. And if we want to do the same, but by using the hydrostatic, the osmotic pressure, then we can use hypertonic saline solution, 3 or 5%. Okay, so the classical strategy would say, well, let's use perhaps CRT in those severe patients, and let's try to start about 50 to 300 millimeter per hour. But many times if you do this, well, you don't get to your goal of uh, a really uh, negative balance of one minus one or minus two liters per day. So it might be too slow in some severely overload patient. And as I said at the beginning, you have patient, you know, very stable, no lactate, no noradrenaline, and you try to get fluid off. It doesn't work. They get directly hypotensive. So can we do something about this? Well, we can use uh, serum albumin, 20-25%, but sometimes it's not working. And maybe one of the reasons is this one here, because in the critical hill patient, serum albumin is only contributing for 70% of the osmotic pressure, uh, the oncotic pressure, sorry, because you have a, an increase of the aqueous phase reactant protein. So that may be one reason. Now. When we prepare hypertonic saline solution, we use usually this scheme here, 250 ml of normal saline 0.9 plus 20 ml of normal saline 30%, and then we get 3% uh, normal saline, not normal saline, saline obviously, hypertonic saline, and this is about six gram of um, hypertonic sodium. If you want to increase to five, then you have to increase the uh, uh, sodium uh, uh, about 30%, and then you get 5%, and it's about 12 grams of hypertonic uh, sodium. We start usually with uh, 3%. We infuse it very quickly, 
of about 30 minutes. And then we have a CRT fluid extraction strategy, about a minus 500 milliliters to in one hour, up to one liter per hour, and then back to the classical, let's say, maintenance extraction levels, which might be between 50 and 300 ml. Uh, it can be repeated twice a day, or even uh, three times a day. You say, well, what the hell? You will get hypernatremia, hyperchloremia. Well, no, because the CRT is doing the job. It's, you know, taking back from the patient the excess of sodium and uh, the excess of chlor. Because the principle of CRT is just to, dis to, to make a distinction between fluid and sodium and chlor. So we can remove it separately. That's a big advantage of the technique, obviously. So monitoring is very important whenever you do this. As I said, clinical, biological, and then uh, hemodynamics, always a three. So obviously neuro evaluation whenever you use hypertonic saline. Every four hours you need to look at electrolyte, intravascular status, lactate, blood gases, and then every day obviously uh, trans uh, esophageal echocardiography, uh, con continue monitoring with PICO, etc. So you need really to have the association of clinical ground, biological ground, and hemodynamical evaluation, and not only static, but also mostly dynamic. Now, we have a meta-analysis showing that if you compare a conservative fluid management versus a de-resuscitation for a patient, you have no difference in mortality, but you have some difference in terms of uh, ventilatory free days and decreased length of ICU stay. So, this is already something interesting to have if you have the very sick patient, if we can get them uh, wean more quickly from the mechanical ventilation, they will get less infection, nosocomial infection, and that's always better for our patient. Now, research agenda, obviously we, are, we have very few data about the use of uh, hypertonic saline solution in this uh, situation, so we need to have uh, some more data, and uh, a colleague uh, of mine, Dr. Rita Jacobs, who is also a speaker at this meeting, has put together a study which is called the DAR study, de resuscitation phase after fluid resuscitation during septic shock, um, with the removal of fluid with continuous repl replacement therapy using hypertonic solution. It's a controlled randomized uh, study, three arms, albumin 25%, hypertonic saline 3%, hypertonic saline 5%. Primary endpoint fluid removal and using a lot of technology, bioimpedance, pico echocardiography, leg raising test, monitoring of intracellular water and extracellular water, and safety issue, obviously, very important. So, Mr. Chairman, if I may conclude now, I would say that to assess if a patient is too dry is rather very difficult. We need a combined approach, clinical ground labs, and dynamic hemodynamical variables. Monitoring of bioimpedance, although, as Jan was saying, still experimental, should permit to have a close eye about total body water, extracellular water, and intracellular water. And the change during the removal of water are not what we are thinking, somewhat very different. Mechanical removal by CRT is a good option when diuretics has failed, as it was already shown in the first uh, talk. Continuous RT for this patient little, seems to be the best option uh, for the mechanical removal in the ICU of the excess of water. And in some refractory case, even under some low dose of noradrenaline, 0.1 mics per kilo per minute, Fluid removal cannot go beyond 100 ml, even without noradrenaline. And then you may try to first use alumin 25%, but most of the time it will not work. And then in some refractory case, then you use 
hyperterling saline solution, 3 or 5%. And we have some uh, really case that responds extremely well to this, but we need some prospective randomized data to confirm or not this, obviously. This remains a very new and experiment therapy to be used in refractory case of fluid overload even under CRT. The role of bioimpedance needs to be further investigated, and I believe a lot in this, to really monitor extracellular and intracellular water while we are removing excess of water, and we are awaiting eagerly the result of the DAR study. Thank you so much for your kind attention.